list or actually I just need to sit here and hold myself with some kindness, please feel free. Yeah? Everything that's offered is just an invitation. Yeah. So shall we begin? And are you comfortable? <laughs> they always say in England, if you're sitting comfortably, then you shall begin. So if you are sitting comfortably, you may begin to close your eyes and find out if there's a way to sit even more comfortably once your eyes are closed. So as usual, the first stage, the first step in meditation is just to really listen in to our bodies with our inner eye or inner ear, so to speak. And just checking your posture, first of all. I like to start from the feet because that's where I usually find my legs are a little bit squashed up. And just check that my ankles and shins have enough space. Nothing's too tightly pressed against the other shin or the inner thigh. So the toes can still wiggle a little bit. They're not just squashed and hot and stuffy in there, down there. Or if you're sitting on a chair, perhaps noticing whether your feet are underneath your knees, directly underneath, or maybe slightly behind the knee. And adjusting them so that you feel grounded and there's not, there's as little as possible strain on those knees. I sometimes find sitting on a chair that I keep my legs sort of held a little bit too sort of close together, just holding them a little bit tight. And if I relax, they just open up just a few centimeters maybe. Checking your buttocks, whether they're at ease, nothing pressing or pinching the weight fairly even between both buttocks and just scanning through the upper body particularly the spine see if you can perhaps give your lower back a little bit of a a stretch, just very gently, and then let it gradually come back to a more neutral position. Giving your tummy, the organs in there, enough space. At this point, I usually roll my shoulders a bit to encourage them also to release any tension and relax. And with that, sometimes the position of the arms, the hands changes slightly. So see if you want to reposition those hands, maybe moving them a little further down the thighs or perhaps closer toward you or Checking how they feel in the in your lap. Giving your fingers space. And checking the neck. Is it bending back or forward a bit too much, putting strain, unnecessary strain on the neck? If you wish, you can move your head slightly side to side, back and down. Just find that central point of balance for the neck and the head. Allowing the head to feel fully supported, light, So that any tension, especially in the jaw, 
the eyes, the brow. Even in the brain, the skull can just relax. Sometimes I find it's as though my brain is kind of like a sponge that's too tightly squeezed. I just imagine it expanding, filling out the skull, even imagining that skull softening. Giving the brain more space. Or imagining all those little signals, circuits in the brain, like lights flashing. Now it's night time, all those lights slowly dim and fade. We let the heart, the emotional world, the world of feeling, take precedence. Just enjoying that sense of arriving in your body. Arriving in this space that you've carved out for yourself out of wisdom and compassion as a gift. Most of the day we push ourselves around, demand so much from our tired body, our tired brain. But this is a time when there's nothing to do, nowhere to get to, nothing to achieve. Other than arriving right where you are. Just enjoying the simplicity of being now. Perhaps noticing the breathing, coming in and going out. As though you were sitting by the side of a large lake with very, very gentle lapping waves coming onto the sand and receding back. And you're just passively seated at the side of this lake, observing those waves coming in, going out. Without a care in the world,
not worried about missing anything, just noticing those waves as they come in and go out. This time seems to stop, fade away. If you wish, you're welcome to just continue letting the mind settle on the breath. Or if you wish to follow the invitation, we're going to explore the field of sensations, feelings in the body and the mind. So gently hovering your awareness around the top of the head. You're going to just sweep through the body with a calm, clear mind, with kindness. welcoming any sensation we experience as we scan our awareness from the top of the head through the face, the neck, shoulders and arms and all the way through your torso, your back, buttocks and legs. Just in your own time. You don't have to go into a lot of detail, but just receiving any sensations you notice as you move your awareness through the body, from the top of the head down to the tips of the toes. Noticing different kinds of sensations. Maybe pleasant, agreeable or unpleasant, disagreeable sensations. Maybe areas with sensations that 
are neither pleasant nor unpleasant. Or perhaps parts of the body that don't seem to have very much sensation at all. Whatever it is, just receiving with a welcoming, kind, equanimous mind. A mind which is curious to get to know the nature of these sensations, always arising and passing away. Nothing there we can really own or hold. Just sensations. Noticing how with awareness of sensations, the mindfulness tends to grow. When you finish scanning through the body, I'd like to invite you now to notice any sensation somewhere in the body. Maybe on the surface of the skin or the palms or the feet that you would classify as pleasant, agreeable. Just connecting with that. Doesn't have to be blissful. There's some really easy, relaxing to be with. And keeping in mind that pleasant sensation, we're going to scan through the body once again, noticing any pleasant sensations. without searching or making effort, just being receptive to the experience of pleasant sensation in the body. And as you do this, perhaps noticing how pleasant sensations affect your mind. 
How does your mind feel? Do you notice any underlying tendency towards clinging, desire? Or can you notice this is just pleasant sensation? Also subject to change. Just noticing without judgment the effect of pleasant sensation in the mind. And if you feel that the mind is balanced, you would like to try this. You're going to just connect to any sensation in the body that is rather unpleasant. Just mildly so. a sort of poking sensation, tightness, maybe an aching knee. Pressure or heat. Anything that you consider an unpleasant sensation. And then scanning again the body slowly and calmly from head to toe, noticing unpleasant sensations. And as you do this, see if you can notice too the underlying tendency to aversion, to resistance or shrinking back, pulling away. Just noticing that these unpleasant sensations have a tendency towards you will. And what happens if you can gently soften around those sensations, noticing that they too are subject to change? Just allowing them to be part of nature that belong just as much as the pleasant sensation. And that can help to strengthen and develop equanimity in the mind. And 
gently releasing that perception and again returning to the top of the head just resting your awareness there and connecting to any sensation that you would consider neither pleasant nor unpleasant. Any neutral sensations or feelings in the body. And as you allow your awareness to gently soak through Just receiving any sensations which are neutral, not particularly pleasant or unpleasant, somewhere in between. See how that affects your mind. Perhaps the mindfulness grows in order to meet this more subtle phenomena. Perhaps you notice the underlying tendency in neutral sensation towards ignorance, not really being clear, perhaps feeling sleepy or dull, whatever it is, just noticing how the experience of neutral sensations affects your mind. Perhaps it's a rather peaceful experience. There's no wrong or right. So to end this little journey together, I'd like to invite you to once more just relax the mind and settle on the very simple object. If you wish, again, imagining that beautiful lake, maybe a seashore, very gentle waves, the waves of your breath. Gently rising, coming in and passing away. Just 
just another body in this body, also subject to change. for a few moments just enjoying being breathed So we've come to the end of this meditation. Just check how you're feeling now compared to when you began the meditation. Can you recognize there was a little more peace, quiet, Perhaps more receptivity, awareness in the mind. And also just recollecting whether any hindrances arose in your mind. Did you notice any craving or Irritation, frustration, drowsiness arise. And what helped you to overcome that? So by reflecting in this way, we always learn a little bit more about how this body and mind work and how we can gently incline them towards where our benefit truly lies. Moving away from craving, clinging, ill will towards peace, understanding, and equanimity, all the changing phenomena of our experience in body and mind. I don't have the bell handy, so I'll make a human gong. If you wish, of course, you can continue to practice with your eyes closed. Otherwise, you can gently open your eyes. Gong. <laughs> Gong. <laughs> and it's really silly. Gong, but I don't know how to do a better gong. <laughs> Gong. <laughs> Next week, I'll ask one of the co-hosts to do the gong. <laughs> then he's laughing. <laughs> no, I won't. I won't frighten you away. Try not. <laughs> okay. So I don't know how that was. Maybe a little bit, like I say, a bit more proactive, perhaps, than sometimes. Depends how you hold these things. Um, I find it can be really interesting 
just to see how, I guess we sometimes don't notice certain experiences until they're pointed out to us. You know, if we have a general body scan, it's all sort of mixed, isn't it? Pleasant, unpleasant. It's just kind of, yeah, it's kind of all sort of mixed up together. Um, but I find it quite interesting when we sort of intentionally scan for a certain type of experience that they're all there. <laughs> they're actually all there. And I don't know, did anyone notice the different effects that perhaps they have on the mind? perceptions isn't it really how perceptions affect our actual experience so if you if you have a couple of comments please write them in the chat <laughs> you don't have to talk at all we'll have Q&A at the end that's a, so that's a, yeah for those who haven't been here before I don't usually do that sort of thing <laughs> it's usually more focusing on kindness and sort of meta imbued with with mindfulness but i think it's good to have different tools in the box so to speak sometimes obviously we all have blind spots otherwise we'd be enlightened already including myself so i think it's really helpful to learn to use the mind in different ways uh, and yes, part of this um, reflection today is to talk through um, what the four Satipatthanas are about, uh, what their purpose is, what they are, first of all. And perhaps, like I say, give you a few more ideas for other practices that can support your main practice. Or if you don't have an established practice, you know, you might be able to, you might find a, a particular inclination to one of these four. So right mindfulness in the Eightfold Path is defined as these four satipatthanas. And sometimes they're translated as the four foundations of mindfulness. But actually on closer observation, there's a very important um, difference between translating that word as foundation of mindfulness or a focus of mindfulness, which is Ajahn Brahm's preferred. And I agree with that now. And the main difference is, is because satipatthana, the foundations of mindfulness, are actually where you direct an established mindfulness once you already have a preliminary amount of mindfulness. Yeah. So, and because these preparations aren't always in place before we start working with the satipatthanas, we perhaps don't make the progress that we might. And as I say, you know, I'd been practicing with these Satipatthanas for many, many years at um, as deep a level as I felt I could go to with them until I started exploring and examining some of those preparatory measures to see if they were really fully in place. So for those who aren't aware, these Satipatthanas, you could almost see them as like fields or areas, pastures maybe of experience. And they, the four are the body, the sensations, yeah, feelings, it can be mental or physical, um, the mind, mental states, and the mental contents. So in Pali, that's Kaya Anupasana, Vedana Anupasana, Chitta Anupasana, and Dhamma Anupasana. These are the four foundations or the four focuses where we direct our mind to basically understand more about how we identify you know, and how we develop a very strong sense of self. It's always in relation to one of those areas that we assume the self to exist or that we identify with. So many of us feel that we are our body to some degree, right? I mean, intellectually, we know that this body is just this changing phenomenon. It's a vehicle, it's conditioned by where we were born, by the climate in that place, by our parents, etc. We don't really choose it as such, but it becomes a vehicle for our life. Um, and of course, we know intellectually that the body dies. And of course, if we have a very materialistic understanding of the world, then when the body dies, we die. And that's the end of the story, right? But um, people who have experienced deep meditation also uh, can experience the mind as separate from the body. And so this is a very deep insight into the fact that the body cannot be who we really are. But then, of course, yeah, often we, we know we're not the body, but we do identify a lot with our feelings. So 
you know, one day you're feeling quite pleasant, you're feeling upbeat, and this is how you know yourself. This is sort of your character, so to speak, or what people expect of you to present. So I'm like the smiley non or whatever, <laughs> but not with a funny hat or protuberance from the top. <laughs> so, you know, and so if I'm not feeling like that one day, then I might wake up and think, oh, I'm not feeling myself because I don't have the sensation, the feeling that I'm most accustomed to having. And by the way, it's not always pleasant, right? Like we see, it's a combination of all those different um, sensations and feelings. We all go through all sorts of different configurations and you know um, intensities of, of those various feelings. So we do actually identify with our feelings. You know, I feel this, I think this. Thinking is a bit different but we very much identify with how we feel to the extent that if somebody say, uh, even a good friend would speak to us in a way that hurts us or the way that um, is disagreeable for us, um, we actually break that friendship off. And it's not really that we're averse to that person. It's more that we're averse to the way they've made us feel. It's the feeling that arises in response to the way we've been spoken to that we're having aversion toward. Because if there's no contact, between the senses and the sense objects that come in contact with us, then no feeling arises, you know? I mean, if that friend of yours who's upset you says the same things to somebody else, you don't feel that and therefore it doesn't affect you. But if we feel a certain feeling of happiness or, you know, dis-ease, then we say, oh, this person is good or this person's really not a good person. And, you know, sometimes I actually flinch a little bit when, when people describe others to me as just lovely, just a lovely person. Because even though it's a nice thing to say, even though it looks like praise, it's like, what are we basing that on? Most of the time they're lovely because they're agreeable to us. They make us feel, we get pleasant sensations around them. We get agreeable sensations and, and that is what we're actually loving. And so there's always a danger there that when that person doesn't produce those feelings in us, and this is very true, I'm sure, of romantic relationships, which are very much based on quite intense, passionate feelings in the beginning. Then we say we're falling out of love, you know, <laughs> instead of feeling like, in, I don't know, passionate or sort of um, almost intoxicated with that person. We actually start feeling quite wound up and quite irritated because they're touching a part of our sense of self that doesn't really, that we don't really want to feel. <laughs> So-called sense of self. So then there's the mind, of course, and we often identify with that, especially with our views. I think this and they don't. And so therefore, you know, they can't be a good person. I don't want to be around them, etc. And then the mental contents. But I'll get into those a bit more later. Otherwise, we won't get through <laughs> anything that I want to share. Um, but yeah, one little analogy that came to mind, and I think Goenkaji used to use something similar, is that these four initially look separate. And in a way you can say they are because we tend to choose a particular route, like some people identify more with practices around the body and breath meditation is one of the kayanapasanas, it's one of the body contemplations. Some people feel more inclined to analyze, investigate sensations, and that's what I was doing with Goenkaji for many years, at least 15 years, really committed to that way of practice. Uh, some people do more of the mind um, contemplation, and I think that's more Ajahn Brahm's way. Although he works a lot with the breath, and initially he gets quickly away from the body and into the realm of the mind and starts to see, you know, how even the mind is conditioned and can rise and fall. And then there's the mental contents, which we all, um, you know, do encounter because they're principally the Four Noble Truths and the Seven Enlightenment Factors. So these are all part of practice. Um, and so the analogy is like the Schwedagon has four stairways coming up to it. And I've lived in Burma, as you mostly know. And uh, these stairways are on different sides of the city because the Schwedagon is so huge. So it's actually a long way between one township and the next to get from, you know, the western to the northern or whatever it is. Um, so you choose a certain stairway. And I always chose, I forget now, I think it was the western one. Uh, I'm not really sure. But once you get to the top, you're all in this lovely platform that sort of towers over the city. It's a beautiful, peaceful marble platform and everybody mingles together. Everybody mingles around. It doesn't matter which 
staircase they took to get to the top, you know, you wouldn't even know anymore. Actually, I used to get lost and sometimes walk out of the wrong one and find myself on the other side of town. So if you have to walk back up again, robes falling off, sweating like anything in the humidity <laughs> and then uh, find the right one down. So, <laughs> But luckily with meditation, it doesn't work like that. They all overlap. And if you fulfill one completely and really understand it in its entirety, then you've fulfilled all four. A bit like with the Four Noble Truths. If you really understand suffering and the extent of suffering, you know, parinyata bam, the whole thing fully understood. Then you've also understood the cause, you've also understood the way out. That's what it means to understand suffering. So in the Satipatthana Sutta, it talks a lot in the beginning about how, I think it's the beginning, about how if somebody practices this, they'll become enlightened. If they practice, you know, continuously without missing anything, so mindful all the time, they'll become enlightened in seven years. And then the Buddha says, what to speak of seven years in six years? What to speak of six in five, in four, in three, two, one? And he gets down to seven days, seven days, right? So of course, at this point, after how many years, at least 10, 15 years of practice, 10 as a lay person, about four as a nun, I'm thinking, hmm, certainly in Burma, sometimes I'm practicing 18 hours a day, and even in the night, I'm dreaming of arising and passing all night, you know, like, I'm pretty sure that I've been doing this for more than seven days, maybe more like, I don't know, not 10 years, because there's a lot of gaps, but but certainly more than seven days. So how come, you know, how come I'm not enlightened yet? And this is a, a question lots of people have. And then they say, well, you know, the Buddha's just kind of exaggerating or, you know, maybe um, it's not literal. He doesn't mean it literally. And maybe sometimes people say, maybe today we're not of the same caliber as people in the Buddha's day. So we don't get the same results. But actually when you read it a bit more carefully, you find that there are some very important prerequisites there. And this comes in the very first paragraph of right mindfulness. And it kind of occurred to me actually, before I met Ajahn Brahm, who became my teacher, this particular phrase stuck out to me and it was vinaya loke abhijja dhomanasam. And it literally means having restrained the five hindrances. And this is there in the beginning. That's one of four, one of four preparatory uh, measures that we're supposed to do. So vinaya loke abhijja dhomanasam actually means like vinaya is like vinaya, the monastic code for monks and nuns. Sorry, nuns and monks. I've been getting on Ajahn Brahm for that, saying you have to sometimes say nuns and monks, you know. So I follow my own advice. Um, so vinaya like literally means restraint. Vinaya loke abhijja dhomanasam. So vinaya means like having restrained and loke is like this world. Um, and Abhijja Dhammanasam is basically like craving an aversion towards this world. And this world means towards the um, five, six senses. It's a felt experience, which is always happening through one of the sense doors. Yeah. So having restrained the five hindrances, then we start to practice. And I started to realize that those teachers I was meeting who I had deep confidence in, and it's not like they're everywhere, but I have met a few who I have very deep confidence in to be people who have attained stream entry. You know, that means they've actually seen things cease. They've had a taste of Nibbana, like a real experience of mind and matter ceasing momentarily. I mean, who knows how long it ceases for, but you know, it can be momentarily because it's such an impact on the mind if it just stops. Yeah. So, and the ones that I felt ha I had that confidence in, it was interesting because they started in some cases like me with um, Vipassana meditation. And later they also got to a kind of plateau. Everything's arising and passing, but there's this sense that the mind is always there. And they then went on to practice jhana meditation, deep samadhi, uh, to really, in a way you can say, sharpen the knife of wisdom. And uh, one of the first teachers I met who explained it that way was Venerable Ujagara, who's a French Canadian monk. He lived in Burma for, well, most of his life, actually, at least 20 years. And before that, Sri Lanka for about 12 years or so. Um, and he's just moved back to Canada at the age of 65. So, yeah, he's sort of pretty Burmese, really. Um, speaks Burmese and studies all the suttas in Burmese and in Pali, I think, as well. 
And anyway, he'd been through the Vipassana system and he was teaching in that system. And he basically said to me, it's like you can use a blunt knife to chop vegetables, but it's really difficult, especially if you use the other side of the knife. But with samadhi, you're like sharpening that knife. So you can just chop them much more easily. And then I thought of a different analogy, which is probably a bit more the difference that it makes. And one is that you can like dig a hole with a big, uh, with a teaspoon, right? You want to dig a really deep hole to get to the water underground to drink the water of liberation. So you use a teaspoon or you can come with like a big digger and dig the hole. So which one's going to get you the water most quickly? Yeah. So this is also how it is when we, when we develop samadhi, we can just go much more deeply into these satipatthanas. And so I started to think, yeah, yeah. I also have a, a friend who's a Vipassana teacher and he recently said to me that he's sort of feeling guilty about it, but he said for the last 10 years, he's realizing he's had the handbrake on his practice because they don't really talk about jhana meditation in that tradition and yet his mind has been wanting to move into those sort of experiences but he hasn't had a map so he's been feeling like he has to sort of almost like stop himself when the nimitta arises and uh, and get back to the body so it's really good to have the whole map so vinaya loke abhijadomanasam is one of the preliminary um, things to develop to at least restrain those five hindrances first of all and of course, we do that through our precepts in daily life, our virtue, the way we use our body and speech and uh, using sense restraint. So by which I mean that we don't attend to things which will just generate a lot of unwholesome reactions in our mind. We know when to move away. We know how to use our perception in a different way to counter anger, to counter ill will or any other negativity that arises. And the other requisites, prerequisites are atapi, uh, which means like an energetic kind of mindfulness that is sustained on the object. So you're energetically um, focused on this moment of experience. So again, that implies that there's already some brightness there in the mind. And then sampajanya, atapi sampajano satima. Uh, sampajanya means like, knowing the domain of experience to be looking at. So again, that's these four satipatthanas. We don't use our mindfulness to like learn to shoot a gun. We don't use our mindfulness to like, some people do teach mindful sex and you know, just how to get more pleasure from the body. But this is really not what the Buddha is saying. He's actually saying that won't be a lasting source of happiness. There will be a lot of danger and you know, basically you'll get kind of stuck. <laughs> <laughs> if you're really focused on liberation, but you're just indulging and enjoying the sensuality and the sensual pleasures, then, you know, you're sort of moving in the opposite way. Not to say that he would condemn those things, but at least we need to know which way we're moving. Yeah? So that even if you are in a relationship, there's this kind of natural um, turning away from that kind of indulgence. And I know couples who have naturally moved towards being celibate, you know, in that relationship. And it's very beautiful when that happens. It's very beautiful. It just becomes unnecessary rather than saying it's bad or it's wrong. So that's one of the um, aspects of Sampajanya. And then there's also like the purpose of why we're using this mindfulness. And this is basically to understand non-self. Yeah, to break through to stream entry where we can get established in right view. And when that right view arises, then the confidence becomes unshakable. The confidence in the Buddha, the confidence in the, the Sangha, which means other people who have broken through, the fact that there are enlightened people in this world. You know, and not only monks, <laughs> also nuns, and I'm sure a few lay people, although it's... I don't know, many. Um, so when that confidence becomes really strong, we also, of course, at the level of stream entry, have a lot of confidence in ourselves in the sense that, not in ourselves, that there's a, a being in there, but that we're on the path, you know, confident that we, now we know the path, we know the correct way to walk. And the Buddha says that's when the training really begins. And then, as I said, the other prerequisite of um, Satipatthana meditation is Satima, which means to be mindful. <laughs> so that's already there. There's already a preliminary amount of mindfulness. Um, 
And when the Buddha teaches us to go and sit down under a tree, cross-legged, and meditate, he says, establishing mindfulness as a priority. So we contact that sense of alertness, awakeness, you know, um, purpose and tension. We know what we're doing and why. And then once that mindfulness is built up a little bit, then we can direct it to these four areas. So how do we know when that preparation is enough to start practicing with the Satipatthanas? And I would say that most of the time it probably is. If you're already coming to the Dhamma and coming to meditation classes, you've probably got enough virtue in your life, enough goodness, enough um, curiosity and inquisitiveness to give it a try. And your mindfulness can further deepen by turning towards these Satipatthanas. But it's trial and error, you know, and sometimes you might sit down thinking you're ready for a certain type of practice and you find you're not and you find you just need to like relax a bit first or maybe stand up and do some walking meditation and get more established in in a more active type of mindfulness to calm your death, calm your mind down, first of all. So nothing wrong, you know, if you find you're not ready, you thought you were ready because we're not looking for a particular type of result. But it's it's important and very helpful, I think, to keep these things in mind. It also gives us focus in our daily life um, to try to prepare the mind in advance of sitting on our meditation cushion. And then the other way that we can know is that, OK, we haven't yet abandoned the hindrances. We've, you know, the word is vinaya, as I say, it's restraining them. Um, but at least the hindrances are not obsessing our minds. So it's when the hindrances don't obsess our minds, we're not just like rolling in thoughts of anger or thoughts of loss, that we're in a situation to sit down and practice the Satipatthana. Yeah. Or if you're like really rolling in tiredness and sleepiness, it's quite possible that you just need to go and have a rest. You know, and I, I just allow myself that these days because I'm so busy with all kinds of stuff. I always feel pretty drowsy after lunch. And I, I know that if I don't have my afternoon little nap where I practice a lot of meta to myself, I just won't feel right later on, you know, and I can meditate later and most of the sit will be just kind of semi-awareness, something between being awake and being asleep. So sometimes it's just much better to address those hindrances in the daily life. Um, so that on the cushion you can actually make good use of your time. So the, the um, four Satipatthanas, and I'll have to be fairly brief about this, um, are the body, as I said, and the body includes the breath, first of all. And the Buddha actually went so far as to say that if you practice uh, anapana in all its 16 stages, so that means the short and the long breath, just noticing the breath basically until you can stay with the whole breath and then allowing the breath to calm down, PT arises, eventually we experience jhanas and then in the Anapanasati Sutta it already talks about insight as well as a result of those deep meditation states. So the Buddha said that um, if we take that meditation with the breath to its highest, you know, to its ultimate goal, then that completes these four satipatthanas. So that's the really great news, right? That's the really great news. You don't need to listen to anything else now. If it's already <laughs> enough information, that's enough. You know, just, just go with your anapana. And that will be, I think, a very beautiful abiding. I wrote down a little quote yesterday. Let's see if I've got it. I have. Oh. So the Buddha said, he described Anapana meditation as peaceful and sublime, an un unadulterated blissful abiding, which banishes unwholesome thoughts as soon as they arise. So you might think, well, it doesn't banish my thoughts. I do one or two breaths and the thought comes back. <laughs> but this is when it's, it becomes a blissful abiding. Yeah? If it's a peaceful and sublime unadulterated blissful abiding then you're not going to be bothered about entertaining thoughts so this is what starts to happen when the the joy and the bliss starts to come in and you start to really enjoy your meditation Ajahn Brahm calls that the stage of the beautiful breath where the pt the bliss is arising with the meditation and it almost like glues the mind to its object because you know that this is where my mind can really relax really rest 
and actually start to charge up. Like yesterday, I talked about power mindfulness. It becomes your mindfulness at this point starts to be like supercharged because you're stopping doing very much and you're just allowing the energies of the mind to start growing. So you all know about breath. So I think I'm going to skip the rest that I was going to say about that um, because there's so much else to talk about. And the next type of meditation that's uh, in the field of the Kayanapasana, so body contemplation, is again Sati Sampajanya, which basically means being aware of what you're doing and why, being aware of the purpose, but also to recognize that it is an impersonal process, whatever you're doing, whatever we experience is an impersonal process that's arising from causes. Yeah all our experience in life, what we are, what we've become has arisen through conditioning, through causes, through opportunities or lack of opportunities, through systems, you know, which may oppress or entitle and privilege some, you know, we are just results of those things. And this is why it's so important sometimes to, you know, speak up for social justice issues. Even on my um, Facebook page today, I posted about the monks in uh, Myanmar who were like, demonstrating against the military coup and turning their bowls upside down. And I remember the first time I saw those kind of images was in 2007, when there was the so-called Safran revolution. And it's such a strong motion. It's just such a strong, what's the word? Like, mm, what do you call it? Like symbol or, or gesture to turn your bowl upside down. It's a hugely strong and quite very strong actually gesture because a, a monastic would always have their arms ball open. You know? So somebody was saying, oh, these can't be good monks. And I just said, well, you know, I mean, unless we've been in a situation where our lives are at risk and we've experienced that kind of oppression and trauma, torture, how can we possibly judge, you know? And that also misses out the aspect of sila, which is based on right action, not just sitting on your bum, yeah, and saying nothing when injustice is happening in front of your eyes, it's our duty to stand up and protect life. So that's why these monks are doing that. Basically the upturned bowl means they won't accept arms food from the military. So it's a real insult in a sense to those military, although they were obviously not really Buddhist in the, in the true sense of practicing the path. Still, it's a very powerful um, way to protest. So I'm not quite sure why I got onto that. About conditioning, yes, about conditioning. And then another aspect of the Kayanupasana is um, body parts. So this is interesting because sometimes people think that this kind of practice where we're like imagining our body parts like separate, you know, like hair, skin, nails, teeth, uh, what's the other one, bones, they're the superficial ones. And then like the organs and blood and pus and spit and pee and poo and everything. They think, oh my goodness, this sounds terrible. This sounds like so much aversion. And sometimes monks also take that to the extreme. And by the extreme, I mean, they misunderstand actually that the Buddha taught that we do that toward our own body. In the Satipatthana Sutta, it says very clearly, one reflects that that is what our own body is made of. But sometimes people think, oh, we do that on another person's body to come out of lust. So, you know, maybe they do that on a female body if they're a monk or, you know, a heterosexual monk. But actually it's to do it on ourselves, to reduce that infatuation and that attachment to our own body. And then to realize that all bodies are similar. And the point isn't to develop a version or to kind of think, ooh, women are disgusting, men are disgusting it's actually just to come to a much more balanced perspective that there's just body, it's just body. Yeah. And throughout this Satipatthana Sutta, there's a lovely refrain which says um, that we do these things so that mindfulness arises till we understand that it's just a body. It's not my body, it's not their body, it's not you know, a holy body or an unholy body, an ugly body or a beautiful body, it's just body. Um, you know, and it's suffering, it's not, it's not a source of pleasure or lasting happiness. Uh, and it's not permanent, it's subject to dying, old age, sickness, and eventually fading away, decomposing, going back to the earth. And the Buddha says that mindfulness then becomes 
you know, that we establish that mindfulness to the extent necessary for mindfulness and wisdom, essential for liberation to arise. So again, it's pointing towards the purpose of Satipatthana, that all of these practices we do are to rouse that mindfulness until it's really strong, so that wisdom into the true nature of reality can arise. And then the outcome of that is that we can abide, not clinging to anything in this world. Anisito chaviharati. It's like, I think nisito, I'm not sure, I might be wrong because I haven't looked in the Pali grammar, but it sounds a bit like Nisitam is sometimes means like a seat, something to sit on. So anisito would mean, well, even if it doesn't, viharati means to like dwell. So it's like there's no dwelling place anymore. We don't cling to anything. We don't, we're not here anymore, eventually. So, and then there are the postures again, like I'm walking, I'm lying down, seated, standing up, or sprawling in some kind of really contorted position just to know and again to understand that these postures stem from volition not from any sort of self it's not like me lying down it's just that there was a volition to lie down and that, that became the lying down posture so oh yes and I mustn't miss out two more uh, one is that we actually do the cemetery contemplation. <laughs> and I think this is probably something that is more or less relegated to the monastic domain, and perhaps the monastic domain more in Asia than in, in the West. But um, traditionally, it has been a practice that uh, monks and nuns would go to funeral grounds, and they would, you know, especially in countries like I guess any sort of more rural area, more so called undeveloped area where they still have kind of open cremations. Actually in Varanasi, they do that. That's why I've seen sort of bodies being walked through the street and burned on the funeral pyres. And also in Tibet, they used to have these um, sky burials where the body's just laid out on a mountain because I mean, it's a, there's mountains everywhere there and they just allow the vultures and the birds to come and eat it up. So they would be very familiar in watching the process of the body start to decay. You know, first it's just a body, then it gets bloated, then it starts to ooze various yucky liquids. Um, and then the flesh the, starts to wear away until it's bones. And then those bones get kind of scattered around. If anybody kind of isn't freaked out by that kind of idea, there's a nice meditation. You might be able to find it. It's um, Bantianalio. He does a death contemplation where I don't think he focuses so much on like the dying process, the way Ajahn Brahmali does, but he focuses on like a contemplation, imagining that you're dying and now that your body's like this and like that until your body's just like dust. It's quite interesting. So you can probably Google it if you're interested, but it's not really my thing because I don't think I have really issues with lost anyway. Um, I don't know, I just haven't done it that much, but I really do like death meditation because it tends to put things really in perspective, you know, all the little niggles that we have in our daily life. And then the Buddha basically says for all of these practices, we, we develop mindfulness internally and externally, which means mindfulness of my body being this way and mindfulness that others' bodies are also that way. And then we develop the understanding of arising and passing. But the other point I wanted to make tonight really clearly about where I think, you know, my wisdom needs to go deeper and also for all of us, is that often we taught that it's enough just to notice the arising and passing. But actually, if you look at some of the other suttas, which I didn't write down. Oh yeah, I did. Samyutta Nikaya 47. 42 for any sutta heads. Okay, so Mutanikaya 47, 42. They actually describe aware, arising and passing as being aware of the causes for the arising and passing. So what causes things to arise? What causes things to disappear? And this is obviously a much deeper wisdom because it's through understanding causality that we realize there's no inherent being in here. It's a condition process that's subject to change. It's not just that it's arising and passing, but it's how and why it's arising and passing, and also what will lead to its disappearance, what will lead to things passing away. 
just like we did in the meditation, I tried to give a sort of hint to notice what kind of responses or reactions to feelings would cause them to like change a little bit or cause your reaction to change a little bit. Um, and what kind of ways of looking would maybe, you know, encourage the five hindrances. Actually, I didn't really do that particularly clearly. It was more to see that there's an underlying tendency to one or the other defilement in each case. But, um, but it's really interesting when we start to work like that. And then, of course, we're moving more into the realm of Dhammanupasana, understanding how the hindrances arise, what feeds them, you know, what feeds the five hindrances, for example, what feeds lust or greed. Usually it's looking at something only at the beauty in that thing in a, in a kind of distorted way. Certainly, you know, if you see somebody who's very, um, uh, what's the word, not just attractive, but kind of uh, when they really grab your attention, stunning, or I don't know, uh, can't think of the word, then, you know, that is what you see. You don't see the other part of that person that is not conducive to loss. And so it's, again, the way we attend to things, or perhaps, you know, when we eat our food, we're all concerned with the flavours of that food and, you know, uh, I don't know, just the idea of that food more than anything else. And we forget to just reflect on the purpose of eating, you know, the fact that this food came to us through the sacrifice of so many people. And, you know, this food is really a gift and we should use it wisely for our practice because not everybody is so fortunate to have a, a good meal, you know. And so in a way you can consider this kind of reflection that's very common in monasteries as a way to like undermine the habitual way that we relate to food with greed or sometimes with aversion um, or just with a lack of gratitude and instead um, create a different way of relating that's more conducive to um, purifying the mind. You know? and, and again, you know, bringing about beautiful qualities like gratitude, like appreciation. So, and then, yeah, tiredness, you know, often we've just been pushing ourselves too much, doing too much, running around, thinking too much. So this is a very obvious cause. And the way out of that can be just to relax the mind. And with doubt, you know, we just start to get skillful about um, the kind of things which lead again to wholesome qualities and the kind of things that don't, instead of being kind of unsure which path to tread. So actually it's almost, my goodness, I've only really done Kayanapasana and just brought the others in a little bit. But um, so I'm gonna just quickly touch on Vedananapasana because this is the contemplation of feelings and perceptions and it's really um, key to the whole practice. I already mentioned about how each type of sensation or feeling tends to lead towards a certain response. So, you know, there's pleasant, unpleasant or neutral. And pleasant has this underlying tendency to wanting, craving, lust. Unpleasant has that underlying tendency to aversion. And uh, the neither pleasant nor unpleasant has a tendency towards delusion because sometimes we're just not even aware of it. It's not very thrilling or exciting. And it tends to turn the mind towards kind of sleepiness. But after a while, we start to notice that um, that kind of neutral feeling is much more peaceful and the mind can really start to wake up when, we, when we're subtle enough mentally to be able to connect to it. And that all these Vedana, they also have, they can be divided into like what's called Amisha and Samisha. I think that's right. Niramisha, sorry. Amisha, Niramisha. Or Samisha, Niramisha, I forget now. Anyway, it means like kind of worldly and unworldly or wholesome and unwholesome if you want. So some of them are much more like pleasures or, or sensations, feelings of the senses and some are much more um, pleasures or feelings, experiences of the mind. And it's the mental happiness that we need to follow. It's the peace, the tranquility, the, the bliss of letting go. That's the kind of um, feeling that we can trust a little more to take us a bit further along the path and into deeper states of samadhi. But working with these other kinds of feelings in everyday life, if we can get really attuned to the impact you know, of 
how things affect us at the level of sensations can be a really huge tool because it's from those sensations that in the Paticca Samapada, it's from Vedana and sensation or feeling that craving arises, especially when we're unaware that these, these feelings are actually changing all the time. You know, we just react blindly. Somebody says something, you get vroom. It's kind of, that's terrible. It just hits you in the heart, you know, and we react. And so we're creating suffering for ourselves. But when we can see, oh, you know, you actually catch it at that level. Right there and then mindfulness is involved and there's a gap. There's a gap between stimulus and response. So you have a choice there to influence um, the way you respond. So reactions become more like, um, guided by wisdom, guided by a bit of a pause. So <laughs> that is a very quick sort of run through some of the Satipatthanas, but I hope that uh, it gives enough of a sense that there is some preparatory work to do, which is all part of our daily lives. So no time is wasted in our day. And that will deepen your practice on the cushion. And also just to know that whatever we're observing, you know, we're not only looking at it in terms of arising and passing, but also in the fact that there's a cause, things arise due to causes and to start exploring that a little bit. Mm -hmm. So, yes, I've run out of time. <laughs> I hope that was interesting. I want to give you a little window for some Q&A. So, and if, and if that was interesting, we can always go back over bits that were covered briefly. So I think uh, as usual, the recording will continue, but it will be pinned to me. So if there are any questions or comments or complaints, and there can be any of those, that's fine. <laughs> I will stay with my sensations, <laughs> not to be at. And, uh, yeah, so your voice will be recorded, but not your face. If you prefer, you can just use the chat box and I'll read it out from there, okay? So you can use your little uh, yellow hand if you wish to comment. First question today from Christine. Hey. Christine. Kristen. Um, I think you should have permission to unmute. Can you see the little, um, yeah. Yeah, I just put it in the chat box. Oh, okay. Would you prefer me to read it from there or? Sure, because I don't, yeah. I was yeah. Wondering about what the four are. Yes, very, very good question. Yeah. So the four are body is the first one usually. And that was including the awareness of the breath. So the Buddha actually says the breath is like a body within the body. So he considers the breath like part of the body. Um, and that includes kind of knowing what you're doing with the body and knowing the different parts of the body. Um, and also one part of that I didn't mention was understanding the elements in the body. So the body is made of earth, uh, water, fire and air. So these are some of the different practices that we can do. And I mean, sometimes they can be just contemplations and other times they can be more like uh, actual practices. I think one day I should do a guided meditation on the elements because that's quite a nice practice as well. To feel the sort of earth element in your body and then to feel the kind of element of temperature in the body, it can be quite interesting and make us feel connected, you know, to the natural universe, which of course we have to be part, we are part of, born from. So that's the first one, body. And then the second one is feelings and sensations, that's one. So it's just variously translated as feelings or sensations, but it includes um, anything that can be felt in the body or the mind. And it particularly looks at the, what they call the effective tone of experience, so whether it's pleasant, uh, neutral, or unpleasant. So it's that aspect of experience, which is pleasant, neutral, or unpleasant, which can be felt through the sensations. I find that the easiest <clears throat> because it's so tangible. Whereas the mind, it's kind of like, it helps me to also understand what's happening in my mind. 
Um, and then, okay, so you've got those ones. And then it was the mind. And I didn't really go for that because actually it's hard to understand how to observe the mind unless you've had really deep meditation. But it's more like seeing the states of the mind in a, in a sort of general way. So that includes like whether there's wanting, ill will, contraction, distraction, exalted, surpassed, stilled and liberated. <laughs> They're the examples given in, the, in that sutta. So it's basically looking at mental states that are more kind of contracted and mental states which are much more expansive. So, but as we did in the meditation, I would say it's more like just to get a general sense of how your mind feels. Notice how it feels in the beginning, if it's a bit restless, or agitated. Notice how it feels at the end. Is it a bit more peaceful? Um, just getting to know that. And then the last one is Dhammas. Yeah, so you had mind in there. The last one is Dhammas, and that actually means mental contents. And according to the Satipatthana Sutta, it's specifically looking at kind of cause and effect and the way that different mental contents condition other ones. And the main relationship it looks at there is the relationship between what we call the five hindrances and the seven enlightenment factors. I feel kind of bad going into this much detail because it sounds so technical when you get it all at once. But um, in brief, it's like the five hindrances are the things which obstruct our progress. So like negativities, negative reactions, um, or let's say afflictive emotions. And then the enlightenment factors are things like mindfulness, um, wisdom, um, energy, joy, tranquility, stillness, and equanimity. So that's a very brief run through, but there's a lot of you know places where that's kind of talked about in depth. So I hope that helps clarify that sort of terrain is that okay yeah <laughs> great okay uh so yeah so madhu has written uh, 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 uh what does the fire element represent in the body? So it's the field of temperature, as Shirley said, it's basically the whole field of temperature. Um, so it's not necessarily that you're hot, <laughs> depends where you live and uh, what sort of body type you have, whether it tends to get very heaty or whether it's more cool. Uh, so it's the whole field, it's not just hot and cold, it's the field of temperature. Um, and I think it's much more helpful to think of the element meditation in terms of um, it's actually, it's felt experience rather than just this abstract idea of fire or, or earth, you know, it's like, how do you experience earth? <laughs> you actually experience earth through like heaviness, the field of weight, through texture, yeah, Hot, uh, rough or smooth or uh, what are the other ones, hardness or softness, things like that. Yeah. So I haven't actually taught element meditation before, but I could have a go. I've done some four element meditation with um, the monk I mentioned, Bhante Ujagara. I could have a go. Good. Anything else before we end? It is actually nine o'clock, but um, body inside the body. Yeah, various translations again. It basically it's like kaye kaya nupasi viharati. It means like one dwells contemplating body in the body, literally. And um, different teachers interpret that in different ways. My first teacher, Goenkaji, used to say body in the body meant you experience the body. It's a felt experience rather than body just in the head. <laughs> you know, the body is there, but it's just like an intellectual understanding. So you experience the body in the body. So a felt experience, in other words. Um, Ajahn Brahm says that it's just a Pali idiom. They say body in the body just means body. So he's moved that all together from his translation. But my favorite is Ajahn Brahmali's understanding. And he says um, that it means like one aspect of the body, a particular body within the body. 
and that's quite likely because in the Anapanasati Sutta, the, the um, discourse on the breath meditation, the Buddha actually says that you can consider the breath as another body. So it's like the body of the breath, like we say in English, a body of evidence or a body of, what else, water. You can use that word body not to mean the physical body. So it could mean that, like one aspect of the body, the body in the body, like a particular body in the body or particular sensation in the field of sensation, you know? That to me makes a bit of sense, but I wouldn't worry about it too much. It's not actually important. And, you know, if we kind of contemplate too much on these things, they sound a bit esoteric and we all like to kind of find the bits which sound a bit sort of woo, um, as if there's some sort of secret in there, but usually there's not because the Buddha was very, very clear. So yeah. It's, it's not really that important. But I think, you know, what Goenkaji also said was, was helpful because all of these meditations have to become experiences. You know, we have to internalize this wisdom, this knowledge. There's no use just having it as a sort of intellectual um, map. Well, there's some, some point to that, but eventually, you know, it's to actually practice and to feel for yourself what is pleasant sensation? What, what does it mean, pleasant feeling? How do I experience that in the body? How do I experience that in the mind? You know? This is um, how we start to see these things and we see them arising, we see them passing and we start to understand what causes them to arise, what causes them to pass away. So the idea here is basically that we're seeing none of these things come from the self. None of these things are intrinsic to who I am to me as a person, there's nothing permanent about this. It's just phenomena. It's like nature manifesting. It's just a natural play of causes and conditions going on. Yeah. And the point of that is that it stops the clinging. It stops the clinging. We start to be able to just experience, you know, ourselves, so to speak, in a much lighter way. And in a way that, yeah, brings a lot of equanimity, a lot of wisdom and compassion as well. I think that's one of the reasons the Buddha says in this sutta that we understand it inside and outside, that we are this way and that others are this way also. So then we can have much more compassion towards people that maybe behave in ways that we don't understand or even sometimes people don't have enough compassion to those who are like marginalized or people who are you know, having to live with racism in, in racist systems every day. You know, we go, oh, they're just complaining or whatever, because we really don't understand that, you know, that is how that sort of system would affect you if you were in their shoes. So there's nothing inherent in any of us. We would all be, I really do believe that we would all be just the way each other is if we'd lived in their shoes. You know, there might be a few things that are genetic or predisposed from past lives but generally speaking I mean that's why you can say that there are certain maybe national qualities to people brought up in a certain area in a certain place as it tends to have a certain character you know so a funny skit the other day <laughs> and it was talking about what the British people say when you ask how they are compared to what the Americans and Australians say you ask the Americans and the Australians and they say um how are you? Awesome. I'm awesome. <laughs> Most of the time. And I started saying that after visiting America a few times as well. But if you ask the Brits, they say, oh, not too bad. <laughs> That's about as good as it gets. And it's really true, you know, for an English person, it's like not too bad whether you're in the middle of a world war or whether it's just like a really nice sunny day. It's like it's not too bad. <laughs> Anyway, that's a bit of a silly example, but yeah, okay, somebody else saw that. It was hilarious. It was really hilarious. <laughs> Bill Bailey. <laughs> yeah, I like to laugh at the British, even though I'm British. Yeah. <laughs> he was saying, for anyone that's interested, it might not be interesting unless you know British culture, but he was saying that sometimes if the British person's feeling particularly open, you might even get a bit more out of them. They might say, not too bad, all things considered. <laughs> anyway, the British people are probably laughing at that. <laughs> it doesn't mean very much, basically. 
Oh, sorry, there's another message. Are we okay for a couple of minutes? I really don't like to leave people's questions. Is that okay, co-hosts? Renny and Derek, yeah. I'll just be quick. And if anyone has to go, that's okay. Um, yeah, I don't want Derek to miss out there on his big opportunity in a minute. I have a question about tension. I've developed a habit of going through the body periodically during meditation to check for tension and then relaxing any tension I find. But I feel... I'm playing an endless game of whack-a-mole or whack-a-mole. That's guacamole. <laughs> because tension just keeps arising. Is there a better way to approach tension? Yeah, just open your heart and say, hey, tension. Hi, you can just stay here the whole time. I'm just going to leave you be. I'm just going to let you be. You, you're very, very welcome. You know, I'm just going to sit here and, and do my meditation, maybe watch the breath or whatever else you want to do. And you can be there too, but I'm not going to give you um, extra special attention. If you really, really ask for my attention, then I'll just, you know, kind of give you a stroke as if you're a small little child, I'll just sort of, but yeah, if you're trying to relax, there's too much effort there, so it'll never really work. I think sometimes it's, uh, it's actually quite nice to just relax so deeply that you fall asleep. And then when you wake up, you'll find that most of that tension's gone. See if you can relax during the day a bit as well. Yeah. Okay, I think we need to hand over to Derek now, just for two minutes, and then we'll end the session. So just two more minutes of your time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Venerable, for the teaching. And I've been a co-host now for five months and I've been trying to avoid speaking as much as I could, so just short time. Um, I would like to say thank you to all for being here. And also that I've spoken to many of you through my role as a team member on the email team for Anukampa. So I know how generously you support the project. Thank you all so much for that. <laughs> if any of you would like to continue to support or support further, then there are a few ways you could do this. Firstly, you could offer a monetary donation with, there's a link on the website, I think, which Rennie has put in, yes, anukampaproject.org forward slash donate. Or if you'd like to know how else you could support the project and support Venerable Chanda, who is entirely dependent on our offerings, please can you email us at team at anukampaproject.org and we'll be able to help you further how you can support the project. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you. That was very lovely, Derek. And thank you both, Derek and Rennie. They were the co-hosts tonight and uh, so supportive. And, and, you know, without you both, it wouldn't be such a nicely held safe space. So really grateful. And to everyone who turned up. And I hope to see some, if not all of you, again. So take care. And we'll unmute you. So if you wish, you can wave goodbye. Well, I think we give you permission to unmute. And if you want to unmute yourself, we can hear your lovely voice. So take care, stay safe and see you soon. <laughs>